Um, I want to talk about my personalised um, perspective on the work I've been doing over the last 10 years or so, particularly in relation to the work I've been doing with Zoe, where I'm also chief scientist around personalised nutrition. And I believe that this might be the future of our health. And I leave the word might up there for you to decide at the end. So what is the future of our health? Well, we know that 80% of preventable deaths are due to just four conditions, cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease, and metabolic diseases. We also know that 80% of these preventable deaths are preventable from just four habits, smoking, alcohol, physical activity, and diet. Now, we have the single biggest change that we can make to reduce diet-related diseases, to improve our health, and to prevent death. Now, what's really exciting is that we know we can change our diet. We know that it, this is a tool that not only is a threat to us because we are not eating the right types of diet to improve our health, it is also a fantastic tool that has the potential to improve our health. So let's imagine a world where we have all the science that we need in order to guide us to eat the best diets for us. Imagine a world as well where every country has population-based guidelines that tells us what the best food to eat for us is to improve our health. Well, this doesn't need to be a dream, and it isn't a dream, and it isn't a dream because there is fantastic science out there, much of it coming from King's College London, telling us about the right foods for our health. We also know that there's fantastic population-based guidelines in many, many countries telling us what to eat to improve our health. We know that if we follow population-based guidelines, we can reduce our risk of chronic disease. We can add 10 healthy years to our lives. We know from research we've done at King's many years ago, if you follow UK population-based guidance, that we can reduce the risk of our disease significantly. We can improve multiple health measures. So we have the potential to improve our health, but the problem is 80% of diseases are still preventable. Diet still remains the biggest challenge. And this is because we have three problems. The first problem is, is that people don't follow the guidance. Less than 1% of people in the UK, and this is applies to many other countries, actually follow the core seven UK dietary guidelines. The other problem is, this is our current food landscape. Our, bio, our bodies have not evolved to handle this food landscape. But even more challenging is our science can't even keep up with the rate at which our food landscape is evolving as well. And the third challenge is that we are complicated. We are so complicated as individuals. Our biology, how we live our lives, how we eat our food, how we make the dietary choices that we make. We are made up of millions and millions and millions of pieces of a puzzle that determine how we all respond to a lifestyle or a dietary intervention. Now, population-based guidance is based on the average, the mean response. And this is all very well at population level, but we now know from the research that we've been doing that actually we all respond very differently to a diet or a lifestyle intervention. We can see up to a 20-fold difference between how I might respond to a given dietary advice compared to how one of you might respond, or one of you might not even respond at all. And this is the premise for why we think taking a personalized approach might be important. Firstly, as a motivational tool to improve that adherence, change that terrible dire number of 1%, but also in order to improve the efficacy, the effectiveness of the advice that we give. The problem is, is given that there's millions and millions of pieces of this puzzle, how are we ever going to piece this together, this puzzle? How are we ever going to determine how big the different pieces are for whom, what matters the most? And the only way we can do this, I think, and this is exactly what we're doing in our research, is by collecting data at a scale that hasn't been done before, collecting data at a breadth that's not been done before, at a depth, at a precision, that hasn't been done before. 
And it's only by using remote technologies, digital devices, remote clinical testing, community science, that I think we can truly collect the data that we need so we can look at how these pieces of the puzzle fit together. And this is exactly what I've been doing in my research over the last five to 10 years. There's amazing research that's been done for many, many years, looking deep diving into individual pieces of the puzzle, but we have to take that step back and we have to look at the bigger picture and how these pieces of the puzzle fit together. So we use these kind of technologies where people from the comfort of their armchair can collect information, for example, about their DNA from a saliva swab, about their microbiome from a poo sample, about the thousands and thousands of metabolites that are circulating in their blood just from a simple finger prick or, or using one of these new kind of devices that you can put on your arm. We can use wearable devices. There's rings, there's watches, there's all sorts of things that can be monitoring what we're doing, when we're doing it, how we're doing it. We can use mobile phone apps to record what we're eating, when we're eating, how we're sleeping, and so much more. And it's this area of community science that we're really embracing with our research, where people are using our devices, they share their data with us, we share information back to them. So there's this two-way beneficial process that's happening in real time. And this is really exciting because this is allowing us to look at how variable people are and what is explaining this variability. And we've now collected data on over 200,000 people across a whole breadth depth um, of various outcomes. And we're now piecing together what matters for whom. We see that who you are is important. So our biology is important. I guess that's not news really to anyone. So our DNA is important, not as important as we thought when we went into this journey. Our microbiome is important, so trillions of, of bugs that are living in our guts are important. Our age, our sex, and so much more is important in relation to how we respond to food um, advice. What we also know is how we eat our food is important. And by this, I mean the time of day that we're eating, how fast we're eating, um, our meal ordering. So for example, we've seen from our data, if you just slow down how quickly you eat your food, just by 20%. So have your breakfast in 12 minutes instead of 10 minutes. You reduce without even thinking about it, your calorie intake on average by 15%. You reduce lots of different circulating metabolites. You change how you process that food. So that's how we vary day to day as well. So how we eat our food also matters. How we live our life matters, our lifestyle, our physical activity, our sleep, our stress, all of this also impacts how we metabolize food, how we process food, and therefore the health effects that that food is going to have on us. And we've been piecing all of this together in order to see if we can deliver individualized dietary advice in order to change those dire statistics that I showed you at the beginning, in order to change from adherence to guidelines or adherence to any advice being 1% in order to prevent 80% um, of all of these deaths being due to diet. And so we've recently completed a randomized control trial where we compared the advice that we have generated using all of this data from these hundreds of thousands of people delivered in a personalized way, in a user-friendly way, using various biochemical inputs in order to deliver advice that's personalized to someone's biology, according to how they live their life, according to their lifestyle, according to their preferences, according to their goals, their motivations. Um, and we found that delivering advice in a personalized way improved health more than people following population-based guidelines. Now, it's important to say we didn't see that it improved health as much as we had expected. We did make the front of uh, Nature Medicine uh, a couple of months ago, which was great. But we put all of this data now. We're collecting more and more of this data. What we now need to be thinking about, how can we use this data to go about achieving real change in people, giving actionable advice? Our randomized control trial that we did, it was just a start of this. We've developed various apps, one of which is actually a commercial app that we now um, are using all of this information, all of these different features of personalization, the who, the what, the how, in order to deliver what we think will improve the adherence to advice, but also the efficacy of the advice. The problem we have, though, is making sure that this is accessible 
not just to the few, but it's accessible to a whole population. And this is where there's an exciting new area that we're now exploring, stratified nutrition, where we group people based on shared characteristics. So whether it be their menopause status, are you pre-peri or post-menopause, or whether it's due to their sex, their age, so that we can actually bring these learnings from the few to the many. That will continue to remain a challenge. And what will continue to remain a challenge for us is people following the dietary guidance and us finding ways to make this accessible, affordable and exciting for people to make these changes against the food landscape that we currently live in. But with any advice that we give, we found, and we've known this for many years, the most important thing that we need to remember is that food is there to be enjoyed. It's part of our culture. It's part of our social interactions. And in any advice that we give, whether it's personalised or population based, we must always remember that if a food is too healthy to be enjoyed, it's just not healthy at all. Thank you very much.